we'll only be meeting for 45 minutes. <laughs> right. I was going to say, we'll see how long we meet today. I don't know. Um, well, it's right at noon, so I'd like to go ahead and begin. And uh, glad to see us here together. Invite us to, as we do for these learning sessions, give ourselves time for a deep breath and let some of the many distractions coming at us just fall away and join together in a bracha for the gift of study and community. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. So Audrey was starting to say Parashat Bechukotai, the very last parasha of Leviticus is notably very short. Um, I think many of us are familiar with the, the custom that oftentimes Bechukotai and Bahar, last week's parasha, are coupled up together just because of the way the calendar flows. This year, they're separated into two different weeks. So here we are at the very end of Leviticus. And um, I'm still thinking of uh, last week, I always feel so struck in Parashat Bahar. Bahar is Bahar Sinai. So it's invoking Sinai and it's the text, the whoever's speaking seems to be saying to us, uh, sorry, I'm telling you now I have hay fever. That's not what the Torah text says. But somebody's been doing gardening outside my window and, okay, there, I staved off a sneeze. Um, the text seems to be saying these laws that we're enumerating here in this part of the Torah don't think that they're less important than Sinai. They're just as important as, as Sinai. And so there's still some of that feeling as we come into this final section. I want to acknowledge that today is the 32nd day of the Omer. Um, so 32 in Hebrew is Lamed Bet, which spells the Hebrew word Lev, which is our heart and certain people's grandchildren as well. Um, and I'm just also, as I'm saying this, you know, reminding us about this notion that in modern language, heart, we think of as about being the emotional center or the, the, the place that we feel things. But in biblical Hebrew, lev meant more like consciousness, awareness, paying attention. So just an opportunity to take that as a kavanah for ourselves for this day, especially. And if today is the 32nd day, then that means that tomorrow is the 33rd day, which is Lag Ba'omer. So I have more to say about that in uh, maybe at the end of the hour. But for now, I'd like to look at some text with you. And I have a very specific thing I'm curious about today. Uh, so let me just find it here and screen share. Um, I actually would like to start by showing you a very short two-minute video, which is um, just a, a, a glimpse at some research that's been done, that was done, about how we, um, how we communicate with our face, so facial communication um, and human relationships, and it'll become clear why I want to show you that. But I'd like to start with that. So let me share screen, bring this up. Okay, so the title of this week's study is Shana Punim, which is if you speak a little Yiddish, that's about the Yiddish that I know right there, means a uh, beautiful face. Okay, so today's learning is dedicated to the, the power of facial communication. Okay, so let's start with this. I hope this will work. Babies this young are... Sorry, I just realized. Can you hear that? Yes? Okay. Extremely responsive to 
the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world, and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother like come on why aren't we doing this even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction they react with negative emotions they turn away they feel the stress of it they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. Okay, so uh, I've seen that clip about, I don't know, many times, and I still can't watch it without uh, becoming overwhelmed myself. Um, but I'm interested in it because I'm interested in looking at um, a very provocative phrase uh, that comes up in the Torah reading this week about the face of God. So remember that in Parashat Bechukotai, we're, we're presented with a set of blessings and a set of curses. The parasha opens by saying, Im Bechukotai Telechu, if you follow my laws, you will have access to these blessings. And they're all um, blessings about a viability as human beings, our ability to be fed enough, to have right relationship with the planet and with the earth, which of course was the way that our, um, our Israelite ancestors first experienced the presence of God. If their crops grew and you know the weather conditions supported the growth of, of the crops, that meant that God favored them. And then of course the parasha goes on to say, if you don't follow these laws, you are gonna suffer. And that's the part I want to look at with you, and specifically the part about the face of God as an indicator of that relationship. Okay, so holding on to um, this clip that we just saw about the, you know, how fast the the child can feel that the the parental love is is something's terribly wrong just by the mother withholding facial expression. Okay, so here's the Torah text. Um, how do I, hold on just a sec. Um, sorry folks, I want to, there. And what I wanna do is make it side by side, no? Um, 
Hang on just a second. I know there's a better way to do this. If I do edit, will it let me? Yes, there. Okay. Okay, so now you can see the Hebrew and the English side by side. And you can see this is, this is you know, part one I skipped ahead of. Part one was these are all the blessings. And now here we are in the middle of the curse, the, um, the curses and consequences. Im bechukotai tim asu. If you do not follow these laws, a, a number of curses will come upon you. A number of, of problems. Uh, I'm, so I'm not going to read through all of this, but go right to verse 17, which I tried to bold and, and highlight here. Venatati panai bachem. And the English, they translate this, I will set my face against you. Natati panai, I will put my face in front of you. So I just, I couldn't help but be drawn to that. Um, and all the ways in which our tradition is constantly going at this question of the face of God as a way that we experience our own well-being or, or lack of well-being. We, we are reminded in this, this little piece right here, even of, or at least I was reminded of, the famous moment in Exodus when Moses says to God, let me see your face. I've seen all these wonders and I've seen you take us out of Egypt and I've seen the 10 plagues. I've seen, just, but I really, I need to see you. And, and by seeing you, I mean, I need to see your face. And of course, God famously says, to Moses, you can't live and see my face, so I'll, I'll show you what you can see of me. But here at the end of Leviticus, one of the ways that this cursed relationship is transmitted is in this language of, not only are you going to see my face, I'm going to put my face right in your face. I'm going to set my face in front of you, and that's one of the ways you'll know that something is terribly wrong. Okay, so let's just read through the, the rest of this. Venatati panai bachem, venigavtem lifne oivechem. You are going to be now vulnerable to your enemies. I'm not going to send your enemies away as I promised, God is saying, as I promised to do in the, in the blessing section. Veradu bachem sonechem, venastem ve'en rodef etchem. Even when no one's running after you, you're going to feel paranoid you're going to feel that you have to run away. V'im ad ele lo tishmeuli v'yasafti le'yasra etchem. If after all of this you still don't obey me, sheva al chatotechem, I'm going to discipline you like seven times over. We hear that kind of... Uh, equation a number of times in the tradition. Vishabarti et gaon uzchem venatati et shmechem kabarzel ve et artsechem kenechusha. I am going to break you. Shabarti et gaon uzchem. I'm going to break your sense of strength. They translate it here as pride. Make your skies like iron and your earth like copper. In other words, the skies will be hard and nothing will come from them to nourish the ground. And the ground, likewise, will not be able to nourish life and plants and grow anything. And finally, as if to, you know, be like a bookend with the blessings, which said in, in a time of, of harmony, in a time of spiritual adherence and observance, all of your crops will grow. In this version, in the, at the time where you've turned away from God, Vatam larik kochachem. Your your strength will be dissipated. Veloti ten artsachem et yevula. Your land will not produce what you need to live. The eitz haaretz loti ten pirio. The even the trees will not give forth their produce. So again, just looking at this little phrase, venatati panai bachem. And I want to explore some commentaries with you and talk with you a little bit about it. Okay, so let's first start with Rashi, a simple, uh, a simple clarification from Rashi. 
Venatati panai, I will set my face. Um, panai sheli. Pone ani mikol asak, uh, excuse me, asakai leharalachem. I'm going to put aside everything else I need to focus on, God seems to be saying, in order to focus my, um, in, in order to make sure that you suffer, that you, you, you experience evil. I will be busy with evil. Asakai lehara. Okay, and then going on, chizkuni, a little bit later, v'natati panai bachem. And he notes that this is, he uses this language, keneged ufaniti alechem. This is the opposite of, I will, I will turn to you with kindness, or I will turn to you with goodwill. Faniti, where are we? Here. You can see the little word panim or pne is in here. Can you, ah, can you see that? The root there for face is right there at the center. Faniti alechem, I will turn my face towards you. Okay, now a, a slightly fuller commentary from Ora Chaim. Uh, really provocative here. Uh, he looks at this passage, Venatati Panai Bachem, I will set my face against you, and notes that the Torah here is speaking of God's angry face. The reason that justice or judgment is called panim, face, is that there is always a group of creatures whose whole intent is to bring about destruction. They are therefore described as the face of God. In other words, the ones facing the presence of God. The words, I will set my face against you, are addressed to these evil forces. The words, and you will fall before your enemies, are about, and then he goes into make some comments about the Gentile nations, which are uh, difficult for us nowadays. But just here, just this notion that Orachayim is asking us to notice um, about the word panim is judgment. Like face, face reality, face the truth. It's in the face. Okay, now let me skip ahead. Torah Aruch. He wants us to see the connection here with uh, chapter one of Shmuel, uh, Shmuel Aleph, the first book of Samuel. Venatati um, panai bachem. We find the word panim used in this sense in connection with Chana, when the prophet describes Chana as having been appeased by the blessing of the high priest Eli. So remember that she's praying for a child and um, at, at first, this high priest Eli comes on, you know, sort of comes upon her and accuses her of being drunk and says, what are you doing? And she says, no, no, I'm praying. And when she does this, he, um, he brings her encouragement for her prayers. And so Torah Roch is just noting that the same, the same idea is used here. The, the face of God is being invoked. And one more commentary before we look at an image. I read about this? Yes. Oh, I don't know what happened to my visual. Okay, I may have to go back and get that. From Sifra, uh, Midrash on the Torah. Venatati panai bachem, I will turn my face against you. You will be smitten before your foes. And they're just quoting from the Torah here. Your foes shall rule within you, and you shall flee when none pursue you. Um, Sifra says, I shall turn to you, so it is written in respect to the evil, I shall turn my face against you. And here, uh, Sifra wants to compare this to a king who says to his servants, I'm going to put away everything else I need to tend to right now in order to spurn you with my face, in order to curse you with my face. Um, so I couldn't help from there to think of the priestly blessing. But before I go to that, I had an image that I wanted to show. And now I don't know where that image has gone. Um, okay, just one second, folks.
Bear with me just one moment. I'm just going to put this in a, a form that I can show more easily. All right. Share screen. Share. Okay, this is a little bit inelegant looking, but hopefully still visible. So this is... Um, this is the the ten spherot, the what we call the characteristics of God or the emanations of God that are especially on our minds at this time of year because, as as I think you're all familiar, there's a way of counting the Omer by counting the qualities of God, and among these ten qualities, the lower six you can see here: Chesed, Gvura. Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, and Yesod, these six, if you use your imagination, you can see that there's a face here. There's two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. And in fact, this is referred to in mystical tradition as Zer Anpin, the little face. And it's... Um, it's uh, Zer Anpin, the little face, is the, the part of the tree of Sphirot that we can experience, that we can see. The upper three, Chochma, Keter, and Bina, are often considered to be outside of the realm of human access. Like they're too, they're too esoteric for us to realize or experience or embody in our own bodies. So we don't um, we don't include them in our counting. But the lower six, and I'll say something about the seventh in a minute, are the ways we count the Omer, for instance. And again, playing with this image of if we could see the face of God, is this one way that we would draw it? It's, it's made up of qualities that fit a face. Since we are human beings and we are created with each of us, with a face, a face that allows us to communicate, to um, build relationships. It's also a way that we want to relate to God. The seventh sphera, Malchut, uh, is not usually included in the little face here. Um, it's, the, it's the ground of, of reality. It's the kingdom. It's also the the sphira that we often refer to by its other name, which is Shekhinah, the, the worldly presence of God, as opposed to Keter, which is the other worldly presence of God. So just another way to play with that, that idea of the face of God and as we search for it and look for how to put it into imagery and language that we can grasp as human beings. Okay, so now I want to go back to the I want to go back to my um, safaria sheet. Here it is. Okay, sorry about that. So to go to the priestly blessing, which you know, in many ways is the um, the opposite of the curses that we've just been reading. And so aware of the word panim that comes up over and over again in the priestly blessing. So that not so much in the first little verse, Yevarech Adonai v'yishmarecha, but then we go on in the second verse, Ya'er Adonai panav elecha v'chunecha. May God turn God's face panav to you and be gracious to you, v'chuneka, chen, to show you graciousness. And the third one, not only should God turn God's face to you, but yisa Adonai panav elecha, may God lift God's face to you, v'yasem lecha shalom, and bring you peace. So we're so filled up with this image of God's face every time we say the priestly blessing to our own family or in synagogue, we say it as part of the Amidah. We are invoking that image of the face of God as 
the way that we understand the blessings of life. Okay, so a little bit of commentary on the, the priestly blessing. Um, I thought this was so fascinating from the Ora Chaim. He's commenting on Ya'er Adonai Panave Lecha Vichunaka, the second of the three lines of the priestly blessing. Ya'er Adonai, he says. Perush Shaloye Masach. Like there shouldn't be a veil or a screen or a curtain. Hamavdil Ben Yisrael La Avihem Shabashamayim. There should be no barrier between the children of Israel and the Creator in heaven. Shabazeh Ya'ir Or Shechinato Al Yisrael. By way of this, the light of the Shechinah should be felt on all of Israel. That's how he interprets this line about God um, shining God's face on you. Rashi, Yisa Adonai Panav Elecha, may God's, may God's face be lifted to you. And Rashi says, Yichbosh Ka'aso, may this be a way in which God suppresses God's own anger, which, wow, if only they could have had that in Bechukotai as the curses are being laid out and the in, uh, invoking God's face as a, as a source of curse, Rashi is saying here in the, in the priestly blessing, the tonic is being given. It's not just that God has only, you know, light and love to offer, but even the strength to suppress godly anger in the process of giving the blessing. Okay, and finally, this is from Aleinu, the closing prayer at the end of most of our services. And so I've, I've shortened it just to show a few little parts. So you can see the beginning, Aleinu l'shabeach la'adon hakol, familiar. And then the last sort of paragraph of Aleinu, which begins, Alkein nekavel lecha, Therefore, we put our hope in you, Adonai Eloheinu, lihirot meheira betiferet ozecha, to see quickly in our time the splendor of your strength. Um, and it speaks very specifically about clearing away the, um, the negative distractions of idolatry. And in the midst of all that, uses this language, lehafnot elecha, Kol Rishay Aretz. Lehafnot, here's the same word again. Lehafnot is the verb of panim. Lehafnot, to turn your face or to, to, to face something. So in our Aleinu prayer, we're saying, may all the evil in the land, and you could, you know, sort of translate this in different ways. Does this mean the evil ones of the earth or does it mean the evil within all of us? I don't know. May all of it turn back to face you, God, to, to take our face and turn it back to the face that is trying to reach us in blessing, not in, in anger, in this, this kind of face here. That's what we're aspiring to in our prayers. And then we come to the closing part of Aleinu in which we allow ourselves to imagine this messianic Possibility. Bayom hahu yadonai echad ushmo echad. That our face and God's face will be in relationship. Like that mother at the beginning of the little video that we saw, the mother who's in constant facial communication with her child. We want to be in that kind of intimate relationship with God, which is hard for us to do because we, we're not even Moses. We definitely can't see God. So I want to just uh, leave some space here for your, your thoughts, your input. And in fact, we may end up a little bit early today. We'll see. Go ahead, Harriet. Just don't forget to unmute. 
So when you first at the beginning of the session, we're talking about um, uh, the portions from Leviticus. Mm -hmm. What I was reminded of is what we read. Um, the it's part of the Shema where mm -hmm. and and it was like I was just struck by how the words that you read were within their liturgy. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a different a different section of Torah that's um, that you're referring to in the middle of the Shema, but it is very analogous to this. Yeah. It says if you yes um, if you stay close to this set All of laws, you will have the blessings that are available as part right. of humanity. And if you don't, it, right, it says the heavens will close up and no rain will fall, and you will be out of sync with the natural order of things. My my favorite is the ending where it says choose life. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Very, very similar. Um, thank you, Steve. And then Audrey. So I'm struck by how the, um, the phrasing about face and facing, um, there's a dichotomy or, or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's easily understood, but we say, uh, it one on one on one thing to, for God or for any of us interacting with a child to turn away, mm -hmm. and also as a negative connotation. But there's also the be in your face to confront. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we and it's sort of like a par parallel negative reaction that perhaps the what distinguishes the confront and be in your face to be mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the severity of the reaction. Yeah, I, th I was uh, like part of what surprised me about this or sort of what grabbed my attention about this part of Buhu Kotai was I'm so used to thinking of in, in liturgy, in our liturgy and in the Torah, when God's face shows up, you think of it as a blessing. But here it was saying, I'm going to put, I'm going to be in your face, basically, as if I put it in colloquial English. And I, I guess I hadn't really noticed it that way before. And so I was, that's part of why I was drawn to it is exactly as you're saying, Steve, that it's, it's sort of, it's, sorry, it's two-faced, you know, on the one hand, it could be God saying here, here, I, 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 I shine my face on you, if I paraphrase the priestly blessing. But likewise, here in this section of intense curses, one of the ways those curses are articulated is, I'm going to set my face towards you. I'm going to, I'm going to be in your face. I'm going to make your life hell. And obviously uh, the way we present our face, whether you smile mm -hmm. or the, whether you grimace, <laughs> it, yeah. it conveys the two ends of the spectrum, so to speak. Yes. And I mean, just as I'm listening to you now, I'm also struck by how much we've had to kind of navigate all of this in the last two years as we've been walking around masked and we had only our eyes to communicate with and how, I guess, I don't know about you. I feel like we've, we've sort of learned to do it as a society, but in the beginning, it was so hard just because we're like, hello, <laughs> can't really see what, what a person's communicating. So yes, Audrey, go ahead. Thank you. First of all, this is a great teaching. Um, I just, I was so struck when you started out by talking about the heart and all the connection with the heart, which I think is, you know, very biblical to talk about the heart versus the head um, mm -hmm. and the connection there. But we don't talk about the intellect and the face is closer to the brain than it is to the heart and the connection between how the heart motivates our action and motivates our brain. So like, which came, like, they're mm -hmm. so interactive, you know, mm -hmm. um, I know it just struck me that the that we that we do so much based like when I say the Shema, I touch my heart. I don't mm -hmm. close my eyes and touch my head. Mm -hmm. And how we um, we make that connection. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I know I've sort of been playing with that same custom myself. Um, I mean, it, it, I again, I think in in the, in the, the brain was not. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know I'm saying the brain was not. Our intellect was not really associated with how our brain works. Our intellect in ancient times, I think, was associated with how our heart works. And there was mm -hmm. more known maybe about the connection of the heart than it was to the brain. And mm -hmm. I think what you're describing indicates that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and the face is a reaction of the heart, not necessarily of our 
our intellect. Does that make any yes. sense? Yes. The, what did you okay. say? The face is the the face is the expression of the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily right. Our face doesn't doesn't transmit what we're thinking necessarily. I guess it could, but it's more what we're feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, boy, what, so listening to you, Audrey, is just bringing me back to that little video and watching that mom. And, you know, I, every time I look at it, I think, I don't know how she did the experiment. How did she just sit there stone faced and look at her child who was clearly reaching out to her? And, you know, if you want to put it in theological terms, there certainly have been plenty of attempts at conveying the notion that it's painful for God as well. Withholding love is painful for God. God does not want to be in a posture of anger or, or, or you know, um, absence mm -hmm. from creation. And yet we certainly have seen, if, if we think of theology in this way, we've certainly seen many parts of history where we would say it feels like it's absent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank and you. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, I, I love this discussion. Um, I was going to make two points. One is that um, I've thought a lot about the mask um, situation uh, creating, you know, a barrier between people. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I think that a lot of us have become comfortable with needing to use masks. Um, uh, but just like, you know, the people who say they're good at multitasking have been shown actually not to be. I think, um, you know, feeling comfortable with being in a mass situation and feeling like you're communicating well with other people, I, I don't think we are. I think it's very difficult to do that. There's a lot of expression that comes in the eyes and the face. Mm -hmm. it, it's, um, uh, you know, a substitute when you can't see the rest of the face, but I think it's very difficult. And mm -hmm. it's actually one thing I appreciate about Zoom because you can actually you know, see a full facial expression. I think there's an awful lot of meaning there. Um, the second point I was going to make is I was thinking about, you know, facing God. And um, I, I was thinking about looking in a mirror, how sometimes, you know, I'm not behaving in ways that I'm proud of. And, um, you know, if, if I, you know, don't really see what I'm doing, um, you know, I can't really make any kind of change hmm. and, um you know looking at the face of god being disapproving is a way of um recognizing when, when our own behaviors are not uh what we really want them to be um and then you know the face of god being a blessing is when we sort of get that sense in looking at ourselves that we actually can do it differently that we're not stuck so I think those are two different ways of looking at the uh, blessing and the curse of the face. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead. I'm just digesting some of those comments to Martha and then to Gil. Okay. So um, I may have a little trouble articulating this, but there's something you said and maybe you can clarify if I, if my interpretation's way off. Um, so my both psych, psychology and theology would say that people are ultimately good. We might have an inclination to do bad and an inclination to do good, but we are basically born good. Mm -hmm. However, there are some people in the world, and perhaps uh, the commentator you quoted mm -hmm. sort of lumped together all Gentiles in this way, yeah. but there are some people in the world who are really opposed to the good. Mm -hmm. um, and I sort of upset myself because to me, there are certain people who reach a point where they're irredeemable. To be mm -hmm. Putin is irredeemable. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that so this is where I'm a little confused. The idea that either it's I think what you said is that there that it's not 
necessarily the face of God, but people who are facing off against God. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wanted to clarify that and just put out there that I actually find it, a, the idea that there are some humans who could be irredeemable, I find that I find that upsetting. I'm, this is not group therapy. I'm not asking people to weigh in on that idea. It's yeah. just kind of a confession. Oh, I know it's it's really challenging. And in fact, I think that's why I've over the years been so drawn to that one little part of Alenu, where we say lehafnote lecha kol rishe aretz. So, you know, without going into a whole, we don't certainly have time or, or space right now, but into a whole thing about the presence of evil in the world and what do we do with that? And is there any, any chance for redemption? But in our prayers, at least in that moment, I'm imagining that even those that are in the farthest corner of evil, I don't know, fill it in with whoever you want to fill it in, whatever names you want to put in there, even they have the potential to turn back to goodness, to godliness. And um, if I if I say that my prayers are aspirational, they're not a description of what is, but a description of what might be sometime, then I'm allowed to be as as unrealistic as I want to be. Oh, that's great. I just want to say one, you just reminded me of something. One of the gifts of the pandemic is that <laughs> for almost a year, I could spend Sunday studying with a, a Kabbalist in Jerusalem. And she would say that, we pray for anyone to be redeemed. Mm -hmm. it's, up, it's up to God, to her God, you know, is kind of a very, you know, real. Mm -hmm. um, no, not a him, not at all. No, um, I'm tangible. Tangible, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's up to God to decide if if somebody is beyond the pale, but we don't pray that way. So right. that was, thank you. That right, was we just say... Lehafnote lecha, may the, all those <laughs> evil, evil parts turn back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Martha. Gil, and then Mark, and then I wanted to show one one last thing. Um, just to say about good, I wasn't thinking about just say what Martha said. Um, some people see good differently than others, and we we believe there's an absolute good versus some people you know there's no relativity with good but some people think there is a relatively some things are better than others for we know putin thinks he's what he's doing is good for for russia and the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we can judge all we want from our standards they've got theirs mm -hmm. but i actually wanted to say that you know it often says in the bible moses talked the image of moses talking to god face to face mm-hmm mm -hmm. But of course, then when Moses really wants to see God, all he gets to see is his back. Correct. Right. So that's just interesting that, you know, we don't want to see God's face for the reason that if we see God's face, he's in your face. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, Moses, who was the only one who could ever see God, really didn't talk to God face to face. One last thing. Last two weeks ago, I was, well, I was at, there was a JTS that's having a series of classes about the relationship, our relation to God. Mm. They do they do these Monday classes and this have a series about it. And two weeks ago, the speaker reminded us that the rabbis and our ancestors generally, until the time of Maimonides, really thought God had an image. That mm -hmm. God they weren't going to make an image of God as prohibited. Mm -hmm. But they thought God had an image and was a real thing, a real being. Mm -hmm. We don't think that way because we live in a Maimonidean world where we are rationalists. There is no such thing. You can't see God. You can't imagine him. Mm -hmm. But our ancestors, especially if you read the Talmud or go through the Mishnah, you see they thought God was tangible. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. it, they had a different idea about God. I mean, they weren't, like I said, going to build statues or anything. But I think they right. saw God was more of a tangible thing. And you could imagine God. I mean, it's like we're reading Ezekiel's uh, Shavuot. We read Ezekiel's image of the, the you know, of the chariot. Right. right. Certainly, God is tangible. Yes. Yes. I was going to say, um, even if you think of the way, uh, I don't know, temple architecture and temple ritual was constructed and evolved and so on, it's all based on the idea that you're relating to a, an entity that's that has some kind of corporeality to it. It's God dwells among us. 
Right, and you're sending up reach nichoach, you know, a, a scent for to please yeah. God, as if God has a you know nostrils and so can smell. Getting back to the face, it's like an interesting concept, that, you know, that the idea of God being look, trying. We're always looking for God's face, but like Bob said, God's face is in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, well, I, can, I was looking for a way to bring in Victor Hugo. I quoted him from something I wrote um, when I was in Israel, but you know, this beautiful. Uh, sentence from Victor Hugo, which is in Les Miserables, I guess, to love another person is to see the face of God. And that's how we that's how we see God's face when we find those connections of love. Um, Mark Wolf, go ahead. So in this discussion, I, I can't help but think about my, my friend Rhonda Weiss, who many of you know, who's blind. Mm -hmm. And or was blind and was blind, right? Who passed away very recently, correct? Very recently. Yeah. And so I'm thinking about what what this means for her or somebody who's blind. Mm -hmm. And since so much of what we're talking about is at least implicitly visual, and I guess the word that I might put in there instead is experience. Um, and, and what does it mean that we couldn't? That God said we we. You can't fully experience me. Yeah, and and that and and that's troubling um, to me. And 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 the other thing I'm thinking about, and those of you who know Rhonda will will know that while she couldn't see, she was extremely spiritual and ex in many ways saw the face of God mm -hmm. uh, through through her blindness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many times we've heard, you know, teachings about people with this or that physical disability who, in fact, have an, an incredibly powerful strength in other perceptive uh, areas, like you're describing, Mark. I mean, if she couldn't see with her eyes, she could certainly see in other ways. Wow. Well, thank you all for for all your good thoughts and comments here. I wanted to bring this to a close um, with two things in mind, just sort of two closing blessings. One is, as I mentioned before, that um, we're going towards the, the 33rd day of the Omer tomorrow, which is, according to our history, a day when the, uh, the traumas and curses of this, the season were lifted in, in ancient times. And in particular, there was a description of a, a plague that that was uh, new, um, plaguing a whole, a whole group of students. And only on this 33rd day was the plague lifted. And so if I could somehow put that um, in line with this discussion about the face of God, the face of God, which turns away from us at certain, we feel it's turned away from us at certain times in our lives. And that maybe tomorrow is a day to feel a little bit of renewed faith, if it's possible, to feel that that face is, is, has never gone away, but maybe feels sometimes hidden from us. Uh, and that notion of Hester Panim, the, the hidden face of God, God has hidden God's face. And then finally, just to bring us back to Bechu Kotai, it's, it's a little bit momentous this week because we're coming to the end of Leviticus. We know that we have the custom to stand at the end of the reading and acknowledge the completion of a book of Torah for the year. So this coming Shabbat, we'll stand at the end of the reading and say, this is chazak, chazak, v'nit chazek. And in doing so, just look with me at the very closing of Leviticus. It brings us right back to Har Sinai, which is where I was starting at the beginning of the hour today. At the end of Leviticus, which is filled with laws, ritual laws, civic laws, um, relationship laws, all of these laws, all of these mitzvot, which have been commanded by God by way of Moses to the children of Israel, it all draws us back to Sinai. And when we leave Leviticus, we then begin the wandering, the 
the stories of Bamidbar wandering in the desert, wandering in the wilderness. And having the strength of Sinai with us as we wander, as we venture forth and try to find our way, sometimes not being able to see the face of God or not being able to feel, to touch the face of God, as uh, Luther, I think you were so eloquently saying in the chat before, that to remember that that seminal experience of revelation has to come with us to give us faith to see through the times where we feel we can't see that face that we want to see. So as Audrey suggested, we are in fact ending just a little bit early today. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We will venture forth and uh, see you on Shabbat, <clears throat> I hope, and at the retreat coming up. And I'll make a plug now for Shavuot, which is Saturday night, June 4th, and Sunday, June 5th. Um, we have Torah, we have learning, we have cheesecake. It's all good. Okay, everybody, <clears throat> have a good rest of the week. Early Shabbat Shalom. Shavuot Tov.